بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم <laughs> in the name of allah the most beneficent the most merciful please make a loud salawat the the guiding star of peace the little martyr hazrat ali asghar alaisana After the Second World War, the scholars and thinkers of Europe resolved in conference of appeal for peace to all the powers in the world. In the name of Hazrat Ali Asghar Alaihissalam, the little martyr of Karbala, Iraq, and they declare declare him as the guiding star of peace. The great French poet Alexander Guénon. composed a poem of 1500 com- couplets regarding the tar- target event of hazrat ali asghar al this po- <coughs> this this composition has also also been translated in english the poem was sent to all the government of the world in the name of little martyred hussein ali asghar al following are few of the couplets for from the poem ali asghar's sunashul start star of every child master of the bruised and hearts triumphant T- towards the raises time without end the you the unquenchable flame of eternal ent- love which to to our souls has given the martyrdom in the middle of the stifling desert of karbala held close in the father's arm amid the thousand of souls in the desert which saw the doom and the victory like salt without an end the love in our hours the young blood shed his owner's name like a sun dying in its own purple glory the little innocent were refused a drop of water and the victims of the tri- tyrant's fury but the dead noble child facing the armies the martyrdom among the deserts scorching the stones will like a test forever the wickedness of the tyrants who left thee to purchase for of a terrible thirst and to die and dying lips refusing the charity of a drop of water the end in scorching desert child you have raised in the tribes of the world you have raised in like a star of stars the arms you have worn when a raided father your dead fertilized the desert sands and in every heart you reach the pinnacle of love at the judgment day we to say karbala the murderdom to our our master ali asghar has engraved thee in our hearts the name shall ever be on our lips for your place so i pray with us for an age gold so that justice will open all paths never can we think of karbala without remembering the glorious murderdom now we shall ever pray that a new area of love and justice and peace shall reign in our world forever loud salawat assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Welcome everyone to the Mahdi Youth 2022 Muharram program. We are honored to host you as the Azadar of Abba Abdullah. Um, as you all know, Mulana Ali Islami will be discussing uh, trials and tribulations. Why does God allow suffering? Uh, this is just a reminder that the discussions for brothers and sisters uh, will be held. So for the sisters, their discussion is on Friday, August 5th. The topic is uh, identity in the West. Um, in order to attend these um, sort of discussions, you will have to sign up so that you can get the address for where this uh, discussion will be held. For the brothers, uh, their discussion will be held on Saturday, August 6th, and the topic will be creating an is- Islamic environment for survival. Uh, similar to the sisters, you must also sign up for this. 
and these will be happening after uh, Maghrib Salah at the uh, individual houses. Uh, there's a request for Surah Fatiha for the following Marhumin. Um, please include them. Uh, Mahmoud Jafri, Tahira Fatima, Habib Jafri, Heather Jafri, Fatima Sughra, Rais, Heather Jafri, Aziz Fatima, Ibrahim Rizvi, Niaz Fatima, and all Marhumin of Jafri family. Chanda Begum, daughter of Sajjad Hussain, Ali Hussain, son of Mehdi Hussain, Sayyid Muhammad Sibtan, son of Sayyid uh, Ali Sajjad, Safiya Khatun, Tathir, Muhammad Ahsan Abbas, Rehan Azmi, Sibti Jafar, Mubashir Abdi, Azadar Hussain Ibn Sibti Hassan, and all of your Marhumin, inshallah. Thank you. Ma Malana, I'd like to invite you up to the member. And uh, just a reminder for brothers, please, while you're standing, uh, move up as close as possible to the member, to the, um, as close to the walls, uh, just on your right, as much as possible. Um, thank you very much, because as people will be coming, the hall will fill up quite quickly. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين بارئ الخلائق أجمعين فاطر السماوات والأرضين باعث الأنبياء والمرسلين ثم الصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيب إله العالمين أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى آل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا We were talking about why we suffer in this life and what are the keys of success in this life we mentioned yesterday that we have to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us out, go through the difficulties in this life. Now, there are some things I don't have to mention and remind you that when we say we suffer in this life because Allah says, or the Prophet says, dunya sijnul mu'min, this dunya, this world is a prison for the mu'min. Or when we said yesterday that if you need help, ask Allah for help, no one else. We said all of these, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't do our effort and struggle and work hard to be successful in life. You rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but at the same time, you have to struggle and do your best to succeed and achieve in this life. Whether it's at your education, or your job, or your career, whatever you want to accomplish in this world, you do that, you do your best. At the same time, you rely on God, you have faith in Him, and you must know that after trying your best, if you didn't succeed, if you had problems, we mentioned some of the reasons. 
Today we're looking at this discussion from a worldly perspective. How can I succeed in this life from an Islamic perspective? I want to achieve my goals. I want to succeed in my education, in my career, in my job. That's no problem, that's okay. So what are the keys to success? Some of them are obvious. You don't need me to say them to you on this pulpit, the member. But the ahadith, they do mention some which are really obvious. For example, one hadith is by Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam. Su'u tadbir miftah al faqr. Not managing your expenses in life will lead to poverty. He says is the key to poverty. You become bankrupt because you haven't managed your expenses. This is something we already know. Or in another hadith, he says that two things lead to poverty. One, laziness. And the other is giving up. When you're trying to succeed and achieve something, but it's difficult, you give up. The Imam says when these two join, laziness and not believing yourself, giving up soon, when these two join, it leads to poverty. Now this is something that I don't need to talk about. What I do want to talk about are the reasons that people here in the West, they don't teach you that. You won't learn it in school. You won't learn it in the university, in business courses. How to succeed in life. You won't learn it in those books you read. No, these are things that are taught to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Why didn't you succeed? What were the obstacles? Why did you fail? I'm talking about things and reasons that we don't see, we don't know about. It's Allah and His Prophet Muhammad that tell us what they are. Sallallahu Alaihi Muhammad. The Prophet says that your relationship towards your parents has a direct effect on your life, whether you succeed or fail. Whatever it is you want to achieve. How you treat your parents, how you respect them or disrespect them, this has a direct effect in your life, your education, your career, your job, your achievements. Now, if you say this to someone outside of this majlis, other people, they're going to laugh. But this is a reality that the Quran and Hadith teaches us. How you treat your parents is important if you want to achieve something. And if you're failing, you're having problems and difficulties in achieving your goals, you must think again, what have I done wrong? How was I treating my parents? There was a great scholar, his name was Zamakhshari. Zamakhshari, his expertise was in Arabic literature and tafsir. They called him Jarullah, the neighbor of God, because he lived in Mecca. This man, at the end of his life, or in his maybe 50s or 60s, he fell off his horse, he broke his leg, they didn't cure it properly, so because of his leg was infected, they had to cut his leg off. So half of his life, he lived on with one leg. One of his students comes up to him and says, Oh teacher, there's something on my mind I'm thinking about. What happened to you and why have, are you going through this difficulty? And I'm thinking, and I wanted to ask you, I didn't want to judge. What did you do to deserve this? I want to be honest. Please tell me. Or maybe I'm wrong. You haven't done anything. So Zamakhshari tells his student that, well, you're right. 
I was waiting for this day for years. I was waiting it for years to come. He says, when I was a young boy, there was a sparrow that would come in our house and it laid eggs in a hole in the wall of our house, our backyard. And I would go there and pick the eggs and eat them. That was something I liked to do. And my mother would tell me, don't do that. Leave the bird alone. I wouldn't care. All I wanted was the eggs. One time when I went for the eggs, the sparrow was in the hole. And I wanted to pull it out, take the eggs, eat them. My mother got angry and she said, leave the bird alone. The poor animal, it's trying to protect its children and eggs. She kept on insisting that I leave it alone. And I was playing. I wouldn't care. And I insisted. But what happened was that the sparrow was resisting. I was pulling on its leg and it resisted until I cut off its leg. My mother saw I had the leg of the sparrow in my hand. And she screamed at me. She said, what did you do? May God cut your leg off. Look what you did to the animal. He said from that day, the way she said it, I knew that one day God will cut my leg off for what I did. And how I hurt my mother and it disobeyed her. He said, I was waiting for that day and I did istighfar. I did repent. I did ask Allah for forgiveness, but I was sure the way my mother said it to me from the bottom of her heart, that this day is going to come, and it did. Your mother and father, the dua they do for you in this world, it's going to affect your life. That's why the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that those who are aq, disowned by their parents. Aq means when their parents disown them. When they are disrespectful or no, they're disobedient and their parents disown them. The Prophet says, you know what happens to that person in this dunya? Let alone the akhir. I know in this dunya, then we'll talk about the akhir. He says, if your parents disown you, four things will happen to you in this world. One, you will have a difficult life. Two, you will experience poverty or less wealth than you should have had. You might not be poor, but what Allah intended for you, you're not going to get that. You're going to have to live with less than that. Three, Allah will shorten your lifespan. Whatever life He intended for you, 70 years, 80 years, that will be shortened. And four, you will have a painful death. Doesn't need to be a car accident or something. No, you're going to suffer. A boy at the time of Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. He disrespected his father in front of the Imam. And it wasn't something, I mean, we would consider as disrespect today. He was just walking in front of his father. And that time, it, it was considered as disrespect. He wasn't walking behind his father or alongside him. No, he was walking in front of him. They considered it disrespect to that father. The Imam said, Woe to you, O young man. Do you know what Allah will do to you? Allah has shortened your life 30 years because of what you have done. Allah will shorten your lifespan. When you become disowned, by your parents. Maybe they won't disown you literally, verbally, but if you break their heart, you'll be disowned 
even if they don't show it to you. They hide it, they conceal it, but they don't forget what you did. That's going to show itself in your life. Salla ala Muhammad wa ala. This is the dunya. What about the akhara? What's going to happen to you there? Musa alayhi salam says to God, Oh Allah, one of my friends, he was martyred in battle. The Prophet Musa, his friend was killed by Fir'aun. He became a martyr. He said, I want to know where is he right now? Allah replied, he is in hell for now. He said, why? He was a good person. He was my friend. He was pious and mu'min. Allah says to Musa, O oh Musa, you know what your friend used to do? He insisted on disrespecting and being disobedient to his parents. And I will not accept any good deed from someone who does that. So your friend is in Nari Jahannam. That's where he is. When I was a young boy, I thought to myself, I try to be a good boy. And I try not to disrespect my parents or shout at them. The Quran says, Wala tanharhuma. Don't shout at your parents. Wala taqullahuma uff. Don't say a word of disrespect. Uff is not a word. Uff is a sound that indicates disrespect. They tell you to do something, and you say, according to the Quran, uff. Or in English, they would say something else, like ug, oof, whatever the sound is, depending on the culture. The Quran uses the, the, this oof, meaning that back in those days, if they were bothered by something, that's what they was, the sound they made. God says, do not make even a sound that indicates disrespect to them. So what would I do? As a child, I was young, I didn't know. I wouldn't shout or say oof or any, make any sound. But when my parents wronged me, I would look at them with anger. I would glare at them with anger and frown. And I thought this is okay. Until I heard a hadith by Imam Sadiq alayhi salam. And it shook me to my bones. The Imam said, the hadith, مَن نَظَرَ إِلَىٰ أَبَوَيْهِ نَظَرَ مَاقِتٍ وَهُمَا ظَالِمَانِ لَهِ If you look at your parents and glare at them with anger while they have oppressed you, while they have wronged you, and you just look at them with anger, God will not accept any salat from you. They have oppressed you. It wasn't fair what they did to you. It was wrong. But for that look, that scowl, that glare, Allah will not accept your prayers anymore. This is the Akhirah. In another hadith, the Prophet Muhammad says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that if a mu'min gains the thawab of 124,000 prophets, all the prophets God has, if he achieves all the thawab they have achieved, but he is aq, he is disowned by his parents, Allah will send him to Jahannam and the hellfire. So this was the dunya and this was the akhara. What should you do now? Please recite a salah.
What should we, how should we treat our parents? What does the Quran say about treating our parents? Let's start from the Quran. Allah in the Quran in four places, four different verses, He says, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Be good to your parents. He, in another verse He says, وَوَصَّيْنَا الْإِنسَانِ بِوَالِدَيْهِ أَنِشْكُرْ لِي وَلِوَالِدَيْكِ We enjoined man regarding his parents and we told him, be grateful to me and your parents. SubhanAllah, you find in many places in the Qur'an when God is referring to the parents, He puts them alongside Himself. Be grateful to me and your parents. He's treating them as Himself. And in this verse, Allah says, وَقَضَى رَبُّكَ أَن لَا تَعْبُدُ إِلَّا إِيَّاهُ وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Allah has decreed about two things. Two things He will not let go of. Two things He insists on is that you don't worship anyone but Him. No shirk. Shirk is not allowed. I won't forgive that. The second thing He has decreed upon, وَبِالْوَالِدَيْنِ إِحْسَانًا Be good to your parents. He has put that next to لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا الله. Your parents and not worshipping anyone but me, they're alike. This is how God insistent He is on respecting your parents. And then He says in another verse, before, He says, humiliate yourselves for them. Humiliation is not good. It's not a good thing for a mu'min, a, a human being to humi humiliate himself or herself. Imam Baghan, in fact, has a hadith. He says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ فَوَّضَ إِلَى الْمُؤْمِنِ أُمُورَهُ كُلَّهَا وَلَمْ يُفَوِّضْ إِلَيْهِ أَنْ يُذِلَّ نَفْسَهِ Allah has given free will to the mu'min. You could do whatever you want. But one thing I will not, you, I will not give you freedom to do is to humiliate yourself. But when it comes to your parents, Allah says, lower to them the wing of humility. Humiliate yourself toward your parents. Humiliation is, some, is an exception. The only exception is towards parents. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala. Now, what shall we do if we have disowned our parents? What can we do? Is there a solution? Yes. You could compensate. You could change. They will notice. You could ask them for forgiveness. These are things you could do for them. In a hadith, Imam Baqir alayhi salam says, Sometimes you were good to your parents during their lifetime and until they pass away. But after they pass away, you will be disowned. You'll become aq by your parents. How is that possible? I've been good to them all my life. This is for those who their parents have passed away. They were good to them. But the parents disowned them. Why? Because the Imam says, لا يقضي عنهما ديونهما He doesn't pay their debts. They had debts in their life. Whether it was financial or religious. He won't, doesn't pay them. They will disown their child for not repaying their debts, not praying the salat and siyam and hajj they have missed. You don't do those? You will become disowned by your parents. وَلَا يَسْتَغْفِرْ لَهُمَا And he doesn't do istighfar for their sins. You do istighfar and ask Allah to forgive the sins of your parents and grandparents. If you don't, they will disown you. You will become aq After you've been good all these years during their lifetime. 
So you should do that. And the Imam says, the opposite also applies. Meaning if you were aq and disowned by your parents during their lifetime, you still have a chance. Pray for them, do istighfar for them, pay their debts. And you will become a righteous child. They will pray for you and you will see the effect in your life. If you're having problems in your life, you're struggling, your parents aren't alive to show them respect, then you could do something. You could do something. You do istighfar for them. You go to hajj for them. All of these good te- deeds, you sent for them and they pray for you. And you see the effect of their prayer in your life after they have died. In another hadith, the Imam says, مَا يَمْنَعُ الرَّجُلْ مِنْكُمْ أَنْ يَبَرَّ وَالَدَيْهِ حَيَّيْنِ أَوْ مَيَّتَيْنِ يُصَلِّ عَنْهُمَا وَيَتَصَدَّقْ عَنْهُمَا وَيَحِجَّ عَنْهُمَا وَلَهُ مِثْلُ ذَلِكِ If your parents are alive or dead, doesn't matter whether they're alive or they have passed away. You give sadaqah and charity on their behalf. You do hajj on their behalf. You do salat and namaz and grant the thawab to them. And the imam says, you know what will happen? You will receive all the thawab of what you did. What you gave to your parents, you will also have the same. Don't worry about that. You're not going to lose anything when you give away the thawab of your amal. You're going to receive the same. And you're going to receive khayran kathira. A lot of good will come to you in your life. You will see the effect in your lives if you do these. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali. Now, for those who do treat their parents in a good manner, who respect them, who are obedient, what is the benefit they will gain in this dunya and in the akhirah? This is very important. Please listen. As for the akhirah, then we'll come back to the dunya. Those who have treated their parents and respected them and obeyed them. The Prophet says that in a hadith, a man came to him, the Prophet was going to jihad to defend the Islamic nation. A young man came to the Prophet, he said, Ya Rasulullah, my mother doesn't want me to go. She's afraid I'll be killed. What should I do? Should I respect her? Or should I come with you? Should I stay with my mother or no? Do the jihad which is more important. The Prophet replied, if you stay with her one night more and give her comfort, it is better than to do jihad for one year. Jihad and defending your country and your religion, how great is that? The Prophet says, one night giving comfort to your mother and granting her wish, it is better than one year of doing jihad with the Prophet. Not today, no, with the Prophet. That's a different jihad. In a story narrated by a great scholar by the name of Ayatollah Sayyid Jamaluddin Gulpayugani, who was the teacher of some of the scholars and maraja today that are still living. This man, they say, he was, he could see things from Alam Barzakh. His eyes were pure and clean. He had never sinned with his eyes. So he could see things, he could hear things that other people can't. He says one day, 
I was in Karbala and I entered the shrine of Imam Hussein and I went towards the Zarih and the grave of the Mawla and I was doing the ziyara. Suddenly a man came, a young man, came and stood beside me. And he said, addressing the Mawla, Assalamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah. He said, suddenly I heard from the grave of the Imam a voice calling out, Wa alayka salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ahlan bik. He said, I turned to this man. Is he Imam Zaman? I looked at him. He doesn't look like he is. I asked him, who are you? He was surprised. He said, why? What is it? He said, are you Hazrat Khizr, the Prophet Khizr? I said, no. Are you one of the companions of Imam Zaman? He said, no. He said, what is your story? He said, what's going on? What's wrong? Why are you so interested in me? He said, I just heard Imam Hussein replying your salam. He said, did you hear that? He said, yes. He said, you're the first one that has heard the Mawla reply to me. He said, what is your story? He said, well, my story is this. We live in a village outside of Karbala, almost 10, 11 kilometers outside. And I have my parents, I lived with my parents, they were very poor. Every Thursday night, Shab Jum'ah, which is mustahab and recommended to visit the shrine of Imam Hussein, my parents insisted on visiting the Imam every Thursday night. But I couldn't take them together. We had one donkey, which was old and weak, it could only carry one of them. And I could walk, but I couldn't carry both on the animal. So what I would do was I would carry one, one week, and the next week, my mother. They would take turns. One week, my father. One week, my mother. Until one week, it was my father's turn. My mother said, Oh, my son, can you tell your father to give me his turn this week? I think I'm not going to live for the next week coming. I feel my death is near. The father said, no, I'm older than you are. I'm going to die sooner than you. Why should I give you my turn? So the mother was upset and she was crying. She feared that she, this is the last. She won't have any chance to visit Imam Hussein again while you're living. The son said, when I saw her crying, I said to her, oh mother, I'll take you. She said, how? She said, I'll carry you on my back if I have to. She said, no, you can't. And he said, I can, I'm strong, I'm young. He said, I took my mother while carrying her all that distance from my village to the shrine of the Imam. And when I got inside the haram and inside the grave and I put my mother down, my mother saw how tired I was. I fell to the ground. I couldn't walk and I was tired, exhausted. So she cried and said to the Imam, O oh, Imam, I ask you, reward my son in this dunya. Let him hear your reply. Whenever he says salam to you, I want him to hear your reply. He says from that day onward until the, today, after my parents have passed away, Years have passed. Whenever I say salam to the Imam, I will rehear him saying, Wa alayka salam ahlan bik. This is the reward of carrying his mother all that way and how the mother prayed for him. And the akhara, the reward is much greater than the dunya. You've all heard the story of the Prophet Musa alayhi salam where he asks Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, show me my neighbor in Jannah. I'm your prophet. I must have a good place in the heaven. But I want to see who is my neighbor. Who has done so good just like I have. So Allah says to him, you want to see your neighbor? 
who is in your level of paradise, go to this address. Musa went, he found a butcher at his shop. He asked Allah, is this it? He said, yes, that's him. Said, Are you sure it's him? He's a butcher. He said, yes. Okay, he sat down, he said, Salam, how are you? How are you doing? The butcher didn't recognize the Prophet. So he sat down and talked to him and said, can I be your guest for today? He said, yes, of course. He brought him out to his house and he settled down, he gave him some food. And Musa was waiting to see what is going on with this man. He's, he's not so special like I am. He's not doing so, something special. He keeps on going to a room and coming back and serving Musa. So he asked him, you know what, why I'm here? Do you know me? He said, no. He said, I am Musa, your prophet. You know why I came to visit you? He said, no. He said, because I asked Allah to show me who is my neighbor in paradise, in Jannah, who is at my level. And he, they showed me you. So I'm wondering, what have you done to deserve to be along my side in Jannah? He said, you know in that room, come and I'll show you. He took them to the room. He saw an old woman in a big cradle. A woman that cannot move. She was just sleeping. He said, this is my mother and I'm taking care of her. I feed her, I clean her, I change her clothes. This is my duty. And after all of it, I come and kiss her hand and I say, this is an honor to serve you, O mother. This is my service and duty. Don't be ashamed. This is my duty and I am happy to serve you. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So serving parents, being at their service, this has many benefits for us in life. You've heard the story of the cow of Bani Israel, how Allah ordered the Musa and the Israelites to kill the cow. Oh, I'm gonna make the story very short because I don't have much time. There was someone killed in Bani Israel and there was gonna be a war between the tribes. So Allah says to his prophet, if you want me to show you the killer who killed this man, you have to sacrifice a cow and you put the tail of the cow on the dead body and it becomes alive and he will tell you who killed him and there won't be any fitna anymore, no war, problem solved. Okay, this is the solution, but what kind of cow do you want it to be? Long story short, the cow has specific features. It shouldn't be old or very young it shouldn't be plowing the earth or watering the plants. And its color should be a very 
specific kind of color. Very specific. Yellow with no spots and no faults. A color that will make you happy when you look at it. That kind of a color. So they looked all around the country for such a cow and they only found one. And they asked the owner to buy this cow. So the owner said to them, this, is my, this was my father's cow, he passed away, and this is the only thing I have left from him, and I have to ask my mother's permission, and the mother said, we will sell it, but the price is high. She gave them a high price, they said, no, we're gonna look for another cow. They didn't find one, they came back, they raised the price, it happened several times, until she said, last price, you kill the cow, you fill the hide, the skin with gold and jewelry, and that is the price. So, they had no choice 